Okay, people. I'm back. Back again. With another book. Obviously. What is it this week? It is... The Matlock Paper by Robert Ludlum. Not a not a big boy. I got this one at a used bookstore with two others, right? It was in a little set little set of three. Now I had known of the author's name, right? He did ye old Jason Bourne stories. And I was interested, right? Like the movies were great. I wonder if the guy can write. I had no idea. So I grabbed these, and then I got the first one. Now, it, it looks short, but I'm a slow reader, so it took a second. I don't know if these are, yeah, you know, no, they're they're still available. He, he's a popular author. They're still available. You should be able to get them. I guess $9 new, right? Um... My rating, right? Let's not get confused. We know the process. We've done it before. It's a three out of five. Why? For what it is, it is very, very good. And if you're already in the rhythm, right? If you want to read spy books, if you're reading, you know, um, what is it? Reacher, Jack Reacher books. Um, probably Clancy. If you like Murder, Death, Kill books, right? Uh, true Crime. I think you'll like this. Just, just enough. But if you're reading biographies, fantasy, I don't think you're, I don't, it's too different, right? And it doesn't, there's not enough, like I'd say, literary meat on the bone to feed all genres here. So if, if it's not your genre, if you're not feeling the spy life, the cloak and dagger, you know, you can avoid this one. You'll be all right. But if you are, if you get that itch, right in the pocket. I remember this time to give a spoiler warning. I haven't been doing that. I get too excited. But how we do it here is I go through the whole thing. I talk every little bit that I want. I leave nothing out. So if you don't want to be spoiled, and if you're interested, I wouldn't want to be spoiled. So if you don't want to be, exit, stage left, go get the book, and enjoy. But for everyone else, uh, let's get it. First off, it's one of these old school printings they used to do back in the day. You know, when they didn't have the internet or TV. As much, you know, they had TV, but you couldn't like rewatch your show if you missed it. So before then, what people would do is buy big serialized, you know, whatever they're into. I want like 56. That's why you go to like a used bookstore and there's like 700 of these westerns by one author. When I grew up, if an author wrote too much, it made me hesitant, right? Like, you're not completing the story on purpose, you're filling it with fluff. And I don't, I don't tend to go for those. If you have like 27 in a series, I might not get the first one because I don't trust you. But these old school authors, they were making up for a hole in the market. And this is sort of the tail end of that, I would say. Because this printing has next to no fluff. We, we start two pages in, book right there, and it ends the same. I don't think there's, there's not a wasted printed page here. That's the very end of the book. Nothing, you know, so it's really one of these to be used situations. And I like it. But add to that Robert Ludlum himself. The man does not write, I mean, like I said, it's not literary. There's not great memorable prose here. He's not doing anything, you know, revolutionary with the diction or the the flow, the spacing, none of that, right? There's no, there's nothing you'll remember 15 years from now about the writing. You'll remember the story, probably, because the story's really good. What he does, because it's not, 
It's not garbage. What he does is very thematic, cinematic writing, right? It, it plays like a movie, like a TV show. He starts with the inner monologues. He, he plays with inner monologue a lot. And he uses this to get us an understanding of who's talking. More so, you know, it's inside out rather than outside in. I don't need to describe Washington, traffic, trees, cars. You, you know all those things, or he at least assumes you do. What in, I, instead, I'm, I'm in, he, he's describing how someone feels about a certain thing. And your brain sort of fills in the rest, which is very clever. Because the whole time you're reading, only in spots, they'll use a payphone, right? That's the main one, payphones. There's no internet. So he doesn't really harp on even the year of the, of the story, right? The decade, maybe. I'd say, you know, you have to stop and think about it, honestly. I'd say maybe like the 70s, right? It happened sometime in the 70s. Or maybe the 80s, early 80s. But him not harping on that has made a, a sort of a timeless story in that it feels applicable to today. Other than these minor elements, nothing about it is weighed down by time, by, a, by the age. Right? You'll read some stories, some of these sort of... Um, spy novels, and they're about avoiding some sort of cultural embarrassment, right? Something to this effect. But you age out of those, right? 50 years ago, it would be a problem if such and such was, was known to be gay. Today, that's no issue. So when you read those, it feels not as good, right? It doesn't carry. His issues, his motivations, carry perfectly right into today. If this came out on Hulu as a show, you'd have to change one or two things, and it functioned perfectly. It's very, very good writing. So, like I said, we start with sort of um, a character named Loring. We we gather fairly quickly. He's an agent, and we assume federal agent. There's DC. He's trying to get a taxi, and he has some kind of briefcase attached to his arm, right? So mysterious to start. But then he sort of throws us for a loop because the man is stressed. In some meeting he's just had, he's gotten an assignment he doesn't particularly care for. And it bugs his conscience, which is a bit of a twist. You normally see the cloak and dagger spy as above these sort of emotions. But he is very much affected by it. He has to. He, he has to find a man named Matlock and get him involved in something. We don't know what. Something that's dangerous. And he doesn't like this. He would rather a trained agent be inserted into this situation, which also gives us now our first indication of a disconnect from the higher-ups, the powers that be, and sort of the man on the street, and then amateurs, right? There's this delineation. Um, and it's very humanizing, right? Who, who doesn't know someone or hasn't themselves felt this annoyance at the bosses, like they're dopes, they're idiots? You know, it's a connecting thing. Then we meet our hero, Matlock, which now is another twist, or not a twist, an efficiency that he has, Ludlum, in writing. Because the previous chapter was a character that this mysterious agent we're interested in. Ah, don't fell in my eyeball. That we're interested in. His conversation becomes the descriptor of our future character. So it's, uh, I don't have to waste time 
right? I can move this thing along much faster. So now I'm meeting a Matlock that I already know about. And then he's having a conversation with his girlfriend of Pat Bellad Bellatine. Cool name. And we're now just building their relationship rather than describers, this and that. We know all his backstory already, what he's about. And we sort of know this impending situations coming to him that he doesn't know. This is sort of a, a forethought that we have. We sort of start to feel sorry for him, right? And all these things, because again, it's a thin book, but it, it connects you to these characters faster and in a stronger way than, than books twice its size that take more time. Uh, more authors need to, need to understand this, this use of inner monologue. This use of feeling, right? Readers can connect to feelings. We're, you know, we're humans. So, you know, um, I will say that it shows him and Bellantine's closeness, but it's, it's maybe the weakest part of the story. Is sort of their romance. He's not a big romance guy, at least in this book. Maybe he does better in others. I don't know. But it's it's a that's a fine line to walk, right? To make a good romance, it's tricky. So I'm I'm not gonna discredit him for that. He and his girl are talking about this sort of large meeting he has with the higher ups at his school about something that they don't know, which we sort of get the inclinations this mission this that this agent is nervous about. So he meets with uh, Dr. Adrian Sealfront, uh, Samuel Kressel, and our agent, Loring. And at first he gives us a, a very realistic conversation of these gentlemen feeling each other out, right? Because you're a human being, you're grown. You, you don't just, you're not chummy with everyone you meet. You're like, who is this person? What's happening? And it establishes more of their character, how they are. Some of the setting, we're going to be on a college campus, Carlisle. Um, but also some of the time, right? Every decade has sort of its boiling points. And for a while there in America, real life now, there were issues with FBI. I mean, tell me if this sounds familiar. You know, FBI issues. FBI infiltration of groups. They infiltrated the Black Panthers, uh, the KKK, uh, Communist Party. They, they were also working on college campuses, infiltrating sorority. I mean, uh, yeah, sororities, fraternities these sort of secret groups that like to build themselves on campus. And it caused issues in places. Teachers were untrusting. There was a lot of mistrust, which again carries to today, a mistrust of government, these dividing lines, this sort of thing. So that's part of their conversation is, can I trust this G-man, this agent? And he gives it a full chapter. But eventually, and this is also an interesting thing, our man Matlock says yes, which the agent knew he would. And it's some of these, he, he doesn't rely too much on them, but there's some truth in psychological profilings, right? In surveillance and intelligence and the techniques that actual spies in real life will use. Uh, Robert Ludlum somehow gets wind of these in real life, and then his imagination fills in a lot, right? How this would be used in action, what ramifications there could be. So this realistic thread helps to hold up his story, and it's very interesting. So because of their you know, psychological profile, they know Matlock is not the type of a man to say no. His curiosity will take over his other motivations and that's what happens here very realistic he has realistic motivations throughout realistic reactions 
grounded. It's a very grounded book. So the situation is that the powers that be at the Justice Department or the FBI, these sorts of higher up agencies, have caught wind of some kind of organization making power moves in the universities of America, specifically sort of the East Coast, right? Harvard, Yale, Carlisle, yada, yada, yada. And first, they don't like that they don't know. You know, FBI likes to know crap. And then B, it's the ramifications of not knowing are massive. Rich people and rich people's kids go to these colleges. Um, you know, senators' kids, tycoons' kids, and in that sense, it gives stakes on uh, to the story, to the character. You're not just looking to bust a bunch of kids getting high. This age, this whatever shadowy group, Nimrod, the name is after a higher objective. And if they're higher than just the money of drugs, they're more dangerous, right? So for our man Matlock, it's a dangerous, potentially dangerous situation with ramifications. If such and such oil tycoon's kid is being blackmailed by the commies, then Russia has this thing that they, you know, now they have oil, they know information from a senator, the ramifications. A through line I can see. And it starts to explain why we need Matlock and not just an agent. They don't have time. There's going to be some kind of meeting with Nimrod and the higher ups in this shadow group. Their intelligence knows that much. And the people involved will be suspicious of an outsider. But Matlock's already part of the sort of sphere, the community, the college community. He's well respected enough to make moves in and out of the social circles and get some intelligence that will help our FBI agent, our justice agent, I think. So I'm like, hey, we're making sense, and I'm interested. This move, this source propelling itself forward. Um, so then they spend the rest of that day briefing Matlock. There's long lists of names of students who are in drugs, uh, potential teachers that might be involved. Drugs will be the way in. It's the highest over turnover, right? People get high and die or act weird or move in and out. It's, it's a way to get money flowing. And um, Nimrod's part of the drug, the narcotics trades, in these schools. So that's sort of his sneaky way in. He just needs to get in and look around in rooms. Right? And he also gives them, Loring, a paper. It's called the Corsican paper. It's written in Corsican, which is like a, like Italian and French sort of. I think that's where Napoleon was born. Real life. Yeah, Corsica. Just a side note. He gives them this paper and it's torn in half, right? And it, this is also another thing that, that this cool spy stuff. If I have one sheet of paper and I write whatever I write on it, and then I tear the physical page in half and give it to you and say, if your page doesn't match mine and my hand, I'll kill you. Right? Because you're not the real person. A key, so to speak. They have to line up. Or certain words on it have to line up. You don't know how exactly they made their cipher, but it's impossible to know unless you have the page and then the other page. If you meet with the guy and you're, they match up, you're in. It's very interesting. And I like it. So it gives them this, this um, Corsican paper. And... They split up. He says, I'm going to leave 10 minutes before you, you wait. And he's sort of like casual about it. Like, okay, it's sort of cloak and dagger stuff. Go ahead. We then get this situation where Matlock, like us, the reader, is sort of ruminating over what he just 
learned all this information. We need time to digest it. And so he decides to take this long walk home. It's a college campus. What's the big deal? To sort of clear his head and, and process what's happening and what he might do. And as he's going, it's dark. He, The Loring guy comes up behind him with a sort of like an intense whisper. Which throws him and us, the reader, sort of off guard. You know, this is unexpected. For the flow of a story, we should have some time to settle before the action starts. But he didn't give us that time. And he's like, bro, my car got found. Somebody messed with it. I left clues and the clues are messed with. So I've been I've been made. I gotta I gotta make a call. But he don't want to make a call, just run up to the payphone and start dialing. He wants Matlock to sort of be around so a witness will help make it more safe. So he says, pretend to fall when I pass you, but you know, he <laughs> he shoves them down pretty good. But Matlock's pretending. Again, more spy stuff. I love this action. And it counts as action in the book. You don't need a massive dragon fight or explosions for some high intense action. So he's limping towards him. You know, he's supposed to be buying time. He just needs to make a call. A car will come and then everything will be good. He waits like two, three minutes limping towards him. But he's just sitting in the phone booth. So he opens the phone booth, which he shouldn't have. He was told not to. And the Loring guy is dead. Shot right through the forehead. He had never heard a sound. He flips out. I'm flipping out. I didn't think, because uh, that's our first character we meet, right? In, in the rules of books, the sort of the first person sort of uh, not supposed to be killed, right? He's the main character, typically, especially in one with no prologue. You're not supposed to kill Loring, but there he is, dead with a bullet hole. So he's flipping out, and then I'm flipping out. And he doesn't know what to do, so he just starts screaming for help. And he starts running and banging on doors. And then he hears bullets, silent bullets, whizzing past them, and he yolos into a bush. And I'm like, man, crap just hit the fan real quick, right? What is the that escalated quickly, the meme. It, it. But again, in a very short amount of time, I care about Matlock. I cared about Lauren. That's just a working dude who had an issue with his boss. Now he's dead. He's gone. I care about Matlock. Now I'm like, could he die? I don't know what's going to happen. He's clearly in danger. There's danger around. And I'm now interested in the resolution, right? The sooner it's done, the sooner everyone's safe. And we get a new agent, right? He goes to the police station to talk about this dead guy. And a new agent comes in, an Agent Greenberg. We, we You kind of like him quickly the way you like the last one, right? So it, we have an affinity towards these agents rather than this standoffishness. We trust Agent Greenberg. He's truthful to our character. And he you know he's telling them straight, if, if you want out, you can be out. Our, our higher-ups have said, you know, we can cancel this now if you want. Just leave. We'll just make it look like a good cover story, and we'll just move on. But Matlock had talked with the guy for like four hours. He's He knows he has kids. And it seems wrong just to, you know, shoot him. And so he, like us, don't want to be out, so he stays in. Then we cut to, and it's a new chapter. We just, boom, chapter. A Mr. and Mrs. Beeson. Now... Again, with the time, we don't get a good indication of how much time has passed from the shooting to this meeting, which is good. He doesn't waste time with this amateur. That's what Matlock is. He's, in a, he's a professor. He's not a spy. You know, formulating his plan as to who on this list he should approach first. We cut right to the chase. He's going to approach one of them. I don't need to hear that he had classes in between or this or that. So we cut right to it. We don't know how long it's been. But this is the first attempt. Or maybe it's not the first attempt, right? It doesn't say one way or the other. But this is the first attempt he's going to tell us about. And it also gives us a sense as the environment. He's going to talk to this B 
Beeson guy because he's a young professor. And if you make friends with the higher-ups, it's social, you'll be more inclined to be able to earn that tenure, to get that real job. You get tenure at Yale and Yachty Harvard. You start writing books. You become more famous. And you move up in the world, right? So this man is interested in moving up in the world. And, right, we go back and forth with this conversation, very realistic. And again, having the conversation starts to build the tension for because our character doesn't know how he's going to turn towards these sort of underworld things that would open up the world he's trying to get to, his actual goal. How do you just, you don't just say, hey, you, you know a drug dealer? You know, you don't, I guess you don't blow up and say that. I don't know. Maybe you do. But he didn't seem to think he could. So he edges his way into it, right? And it, and they, and they, move along until they're they're all doing drugs like some kind of pill to get high actually high now the Beesons go hard into it they're like five seven ten pills deep he starts faking it like ah, i'm taking pills but he's not he's you know hiding them so he's just barely high and they're stupid high right they're acting all kind of weird and he kind of pushes it and the beast is sort of, in his highness, he's still, you know, hyper aware. And he doesn't like something that he heard, and he has to make a call. And our boy thinks, yeah, I think he made me. So he quietly goes to the door, and because the guy's high, he thinks he's whispering, but he's talking real loud. And he's like, dang it, he did make me. He understands I'm here for something other than what I'm here for. But he's like, if it's blown, I might as well try and get a name before it all goes to crap. And then he hears a name called Holden, which is sort of shocking to him. Holden is the venerable old man of Carlisle. Very respected, put on a pedestal, and he just he can't believe it's him. So rather than just let his cover be blown, he's like, I got to get more intel, and I got to warn... Um, Holden? Did I say Holden? God, his name's somewhere here. Heron. I gotta warn Heron. Sorry, not Holden. I have to warn Heron, or at least give him a heads up. He's earned that, right? So to get out of the situation of being um, suspicious, he pretends to be higher than he is, and he pretends to be getting, you know, sort of frisky with the guy's wife, which the guy who's skeevy doesn't seem to hate. When he comes in and catches him, he sort of then is okay with, I have this thing over this professor. He's this creeper, rapey kind of guy. But dirty is more my people, right? Because he's a, he's a dirty drug head. And so he didn't, he's, he's, he's like, we're good then. He's, he can't be an agent. He can't be a cop. He wouldn't be trying what he was trying with my wife if he was. And so he, he sort of escapes that situation and again like before he's left with this heavy thing to ruminate over and when a side note when he says heron i completely think of the wheel of time because it's mentioned so often in that book but that's a thousand percent my issue and don't let it hamper this book whatsoever in your mind but it's just Another thing, speaking of names reminding you of stuff. When I got this book, I thought Matlock would throw me. I've, there's a TV show called Matlock, and I've seen like 10,000 of the episodes. right? So I thought, I'm only be thinking of this old guy the whole time. But a credit to Ludlum's writing, after page one or two, that's, that's out the window. It, it can be a problem in books. If you're on a space crew, I've read one book. Where they're all on a space sort of ship. Well, I almost read it. And the lady's like, I'd like you to meet my um, chief engineer, Yao Ming. And I just bust out laughing. I put the book down. I couldn't read anymore. I couldn't not think of a seven-foot Asian dude when I hear Yao Ming, right? So sometimes the name can ruin it. And I thought this would be one, but his superior writing overcomes this. So... 
again, we, we think we have time to digest, but he doesn't give us time. Our boy Matlock gets home, semi-high, and his his apartment is trashed, right? Things kicked, smashed, books torn, you know, things slashed. He flips out a little bit, right? He sobers up and flips out because clearly they didn't just rob him. They, I don't need to rob a dude. You know, I don't need to slash his cushions to rob him. They're looking for the Corsican paper. The threat's closer to home than he thought, than we thought as readers. Now, he's hidden the Corsican paper in the kitty litter, which gives us, again, a little spy moment. He likes to pepper him in. And he starts to start to think, how do I get to there? without a possible someone looking through my windows and seeing me go for it and thus revealing a secret location. And he fakes sort of like a cut and runs to the bathroom and checks it real quick. And it's there and he's, he's okay. It's there, he's okay. But it's a cool little spy moment, right? And it's something a non-spy, an educated man, he's a professor, would be able to think of on the fly. He makes calls. The cops come. He's talking to the cops. He's going to play it off because either they know he's involved, in which case he's, there's no reason to be out of danger. They're, they're going to deal with him how they deal with him, or they don't. And if they don't, he's got to play it like a regular citizen would. You call it the cops. So the cops come, and they're talking. Then the cop acts kind of weird. Right? And then he... And us, the readers, are left in the same spot once the cops leave. And it's, you know, I'm kind of high. Am I just, you know, over overanalyzing it? Either either I'm overanalyzing it and just taking it for more than it is. Or the, the cop's sort of in on it, which is a bigger problem, but I don't have any proof either way. Right? So it's this, he's like, maybe it's just the suspicion going overboard. He can't be sure, and we can't be sure. But it makes us uneasy, right? It makes you as a reader very uneasy. And, and he maintains this through the book. This unease, this suspicion. It weighs heavily on you for such a small book. Then his girlfriend comes over because she couldn't get a hold of him. And she sees the place, you know, sort of a wreck. And we have the, the part I always hate in these spy books. And it's the old, you can't tell your lady friend anything, right? And you have to have that hard conversation of, you got to trust me, but I can't tell you what this is about. And she's like, if you trusted me, you could tell me. And I'm always like, bro, tell them, right? If they're your people, if they're dirty or corruptible, then you're done anyway, right? If they're so stupid, they'll blab. Maybe then don't tell them, but... Who knows somebody that's stupid that's like real close to you? Keep this one secret, bro. Right? Don't get drunk and tell the spill the beans. But it's not even like you're in the mega deep cover. But he's suspicious and he, you know he's full of suspicion and he's like, for her safety, I can't tell her. That always annoys me. But I guess it's natural, right? It's it's the way it would happen. So again, realistic. Very grounded book. I like it. Then he has about a cloak and dagger kind of meeting at a, a handball court or a racquetball squash. One of those sort of uh, yuppie sports that the bankers do, right? Whatever. I don't know what it was. But, they, you know, him and the new agent have this long conversation. But I like the thinking of it. They throw the ball just to keep the sounds going. The agent's constantly looking around, making sure no one's watching. He has this sort of cloak and dagger way he gets there. And it keeps the the water temperature up. Very fun. I love some cloak and dagger. Don't get me wrong, I love it. He then, again, we don't know how many days after, goes to sort of a black revolutionist group on campus. Right? So, you know... There's always these groups. I think in the day it was the Black Panthers. And he sort of hints that it's a kind of an offshoot of this. These sort of Black Pride fraternity kind of situation. 
and they're doing some kind of a weird African ceremony that freaks him out. He thinks some kid's going to get stabbed. But they don't. They were, they were highly practiced, and everyone's fine. But anytime he panics, you know, you as a reader sort of panic. So then he meets the choreographer, uh, Debenor, a Debenor, or something to this effect. It's a cool French-sounding kind of name, and they're talking. He takes a drink, and then he starts flipping out because the drink was um, drugged. He sort of gets the feeling this was drugged, and this African Debono like attacks him, like give me that, give me the, where's the paper, where's the paper? And in like a panic, he just before he's like, I gotta attack before I go too high, and then I gotta get out of here, because I'll be at their whim, I'm in danger. He just like attacks the guy not any kind of like trained kung fu right he's not a trained agent but a surprise attack can be vicious he hits the man's glasses you know, glass in his eyes there's the 80s they don't have the safety glass so it's like some glass in his face and he's like you know sort of manically pounding on him before he just yellows out and then he gets picked up by the agent and then you know later when he starts coming to it's the agent and the girlfriend helping him through this horrible acid trip or whatever. Which, again, you know, it's realistic. You can't just drop acid and just be cool. You know, jump out a window or, you know, eat somebody's face. But, again, here we have the, the same I can't tell Pat anything situation, which annoys me. But she doesn't ask too many questions and she leaves. And... Agent Greenberg brings up a, a terminology that I really like. He peppers them in, our Ludlam. He says Matlock's OOS, out of strategy. It's just this, an official sounding kind of verbiage. I don't know if it's real. I'm not a spy. I don't know if that would be actual language they use at the Justice Department, but it sounds like it could be, right? And that's all you need. All I need is it to sound right. I'm in this spy crap. Very fun. But he doesn't want out. He wants to stay in. So his next move is to go um, warn the venerable Heron, who he sure is innocent. And he has to warn him because he's too respected. He's like the, the spitting image, the knightliest knight, the purest of the Carlisle people. So he has to go warn him. And he drives way out. And starts having a conversation with this old guy. And uh, he spills the beans to this guy. Nimrod, like, you know what's up. The whole nine yards, he spills the beans to this guy. And I'm like, the crap, bro? You, you can't tell your girl? You spilled the beans to this old guy? It's so annoying. But it makes sense for the character. Because he's very concerned about Carlisle, the university. It's just annoying. In any case, the the old guy, in a weird, almost like horror movie twist, freaks the crap out. And he's old and rickety. And he just like freaks out on him. Like, don't touch me. Get, get out. Get out. And he runs off into the woods that are just around his, his backyard. Slowly. He's not he's not fast. And Matlock's like, bro, don't, don't freak out like this. And he's worried like the man's old is going to have a heart attack and die. So he tries to chase after him. But loses him in the thicket. And here's like a one last, you know, pained word says Nimrod. It's the last word somewhere in the woods. Very horror movie almost. Very disturbing. <sighs> then he goes on like um he, he takes Pat out to try and ease things over. It's getting hard. It's hard on the relationship. And in that, at that restaurant, he goes and he receives a call. So he goes in the back because, and again, no cell phones. A small thing, but it's easily overcome. He goes in the back and he learns that the Heron dude killed himself and he's devastated, right? He's shook. He can barely stand. And he hears all the news and he wants to go talk to Greenberg so he hangs up and he's going to go talk to Pat, but she's gone. So now there's this double shock. 
He thinks, he hopes, they think, they hope that she just left on her own. She's a strong-willed young woman. She just went on her own, but he kind of thinks maybe she didn't go on her own. That she was kidnapped. So they're trying to look for her. And in the midst of this, sort of, this looking for her and this argument between the agent, Greenberg, and him about him being, you need to get out, bro. It's too much. You're, you need to get out. And again, the agent cares for him. And he's not sure if he's going to get out or not when a bomb goes off. Just a full-on, the, the living room sort of explodes. And then, like, he, because of his Vietnam experience, knows from the smell or something that there's going to be a secondary bomb. And he actually saves Agent Greensburg's life, tackling him. Second bomb goes off. It's kind of crazy. An actual bomb. And, and then they're getting up. They're, they're sort of disorientated. They go outside, and then a triple, you know, the horror of horrors, he sees a body there, and it's his girl. And she's clearly, you know, she's been tortured, right? She looks dead. There's blood on her. She's cut up. And this is, again, just, just shock. Shock, not shock value, but it is a devastating blow when you read it. And you don't know what this means. You feel it. He runs up to her, and the agent sort of like shoves him away. Because he's like, you're not going to be in the right state for this. He sees that, you know, her eyes move. And so he starts shouting orders, 911, get an ambulance here until people pay attention. Then he picks her up because he, as an agent, knows she's not going to die. She's just really messed up, right? She's going to need medical attention very quickly. And so he starts to try and do what he can till the ambulance gets there. And our boy Matlock's too much for him. He's, he's shook, beyond shook, right? The ambulance gets there. And they, they sort of take her to the hospital. And, and Matlock's like, he sort of wounded too. There was a bomb that went off. So he sort of passes out because it's too much. He wakes up in the hospital. And then Greenberg's like, you know, sorry, you're out. And Matlock's like, the crap I am. I'm going to see this to the end now. And then we get this little insight into how right these agencies work. Because he gets an official letter from the agency that more or less tells them that, you know, he is out. But they kind of back channel. They're like, look, we want you in. But officially, we're saying you're out. So that when, you know, if something bad happens to you, we can be like, look at this paper. We wanted him out. Right? Of this plausible deniability. Which, again, I don't work for the FBI. I don't know. But that sounds like some FBI Justice Department crap. Right? To, to kick up a hornet's nest. And then sort of give themselves an out because they're chickens and then if all goes good they can brush right up to you and sort of eat in that glory and move up all right they're, they can be sort of dirty but it's the spy game you know it is what it is but he ain't he ain't getting out now he has vengeance on his mind right you hurt my girl <sighs> this poor innocent girl didn't do anything and he can't let it go so then it it picks up a pace that it didn't have before right He's really going to drive his point home, whatever point he thinks he has. So he gathers up as much information as he can, and he makes his move. And the movie he picks is to try and find an underground casino. Connecticut, you know, Boston, the, the Northeast. There's a lot of people there, but they don't have any casinos. But, you know, people like to gamble. So you can reasonably assume they hide some. I'll make a swim club or a country club or, you know, a gentle, uh, a lounge or something. And in the back room where no one knows because it's all membership, there's a guy dealing cards and we're, you know, betting high stakes. So he goes and he starts throwing names around and just acting like he's about it. Right. He gathered up his money. He got a loan from his dad. His idea is to get in to some of these casinos, throw names around, and just burn through some money. Because there's nothing casinos like more 
than a big spender, right? You, you, the least suspicious thing on earth is a big spender because I got to get that money. And that's what he does. He gets in. He's big spending. He acts very casual about losing like $5,000, which in the 80s is a chunk of change. But he has money to burn. He's on a burn strategy. If this doesn't work in a short amount of time, he's out of money and he has out of options anyway. So he uses the first sort of casino guy to be chummy with. And he wants him, like, I've got to go somewhere else closer to Carlisle. Is there someone else I can be chummy with? And he gives him a name. <clears throat> and he's like, I'll meet you there, you know. Because he's like, yeah, i got a guy from London. So they're thinking, this is a big foreign spender. I, wa I want some of that. And so they do. He gets a buddy to pretend to be a gambler. He just has to loan the money and he has to waste it. No big deal. And so him and his buddy meet this other guy. Right? And, th and they're all really chummy. And he finagles the conversation to, you know, I need somewhere to stay day on my way to Carlisle. And so a third guy is introduced, right? N a couple of nights in between. And so he's going to stay at some kind of a, uh, it's like a family place, swimming or just lounging, some kind of thing, right? Some kind of family country club, a restaurant maybe. <clears throat> and at the country club is where he sort of sees more of the scope a girl is sent to him, right, for illicit reasons, and she's young, and he realizes she's from one of these colleges. So he confronts her, and it turns out there's like, she's not on drugs, she's not in debt. Her friends sort of tricked her, pushed her into it, but it's more of a, a saving thing, right? It's, she doesn't keep doing it for money she gets money while she's doing it but it's um they've lured a bunch of her friends into this prostitution ring and if any one of them says anything they'll out all of them and then reputations are ruined and parents are embarrassed and lives can't be lived right so she's like i'm just gonna see my way out of college and get out but he's sort of shocked by this that and he imagines because he knows where the colleges are it's not just Carlisle, right? It could be this massive East Coast web, of, you know, these poor girls and this prostitution and these drugs with professors. It, it sort of lifts the veil, and he doesn't like it. He, he'd rather be back in the Matrix, so to speak, when everything was nice, but he's too far in now. <clears throat> so he's going to leave to talk to Greenberg, and the, the main guy stops him. And he has to play it off somehow, and he, he goes hard in the paint rather than easy and that aggressiveness makes the guy start to think that he's part of the higher ups right that they were sent to check on him so he uses that to get this he's like i need i need someone for real we're checking on people who else do i check on right and the guy gives him a name and he sort of plays the same thing with that guy he sort of squeezes kind of hard and feigns like he's higher up. It's just a pure bluff on top of a bluff. But it works. The guy's going to get him into a certain connection with a certain meeting with Nimrod. And then that night, the night when he's finalizing this deal, guys inside, the other casino guys that he knew because they all came, got like shot the crap up somehow. I mean, it's a bloody, another bloody mess. And you're just like, man, this guy's riding this thing dangerous line, right? The danger's ever present. There's death involved. I, I might not even suggest this book if you're sort of like, you don't take shocks well, right? If you don't watch suspense movies, don't read this book. Because he can really, he really brings you there, right? Very fun if you like the suspense, if you like that ride. I liked it, I don't know if I'd like it too much longer, but it was it was good. So he, he goes for his special meeting, and it's sort of a rainy off-season ski lift. So there's no snow, and it's just a mountainside, and he's going up a ski lift, and it suddenly stops with him 15 feet up in the air, right? High enough that you could jump if you shimmied down, but too high to want to do it. And the guy with the flashlight starts blinding him and says, you know, throw down the paper. We got you. And then it hits him. 
all his finagling, all his spycraft, he's just an amateur. They saw right through him. He's caught, you know, he's a rat in a trap. He can't go anywhere. Caught like a rat by a rat. Dude has a gun. He can't, he's dead to rights. So he does what you would do, right? He's like, I don't have it on me. I have to come down and show you where it is. Kind of <laughs> kind of situation. He fakes it. So he falls down. He pretends that he has a hurt ankle, that he can't reach it. And the guy gets close enough that he makes a, just a, a desperate move. He goes for the gun and plows into the guy. Throw, the guy's thrown. The gun goes off. It's noise. And he starts viciously, you know, just fighting. He gets the upper hand. He gets the upper hand, he gets the gun from the guy, right? And he's like, you know, who, who sent you? Who's Nimrod? He's asking him these questions. And the guy bugs out. He just like leaps for it, the same as him, but his, he just the, the gun goes off. He blows this guy's head off. In the rain, It's so he's panicking now, right? And it's, it's too real. So he escapes the ski resort. Obviously, people know he was there. He's killed a guy. And then he's being followed by someone else. And he gets run off the road. His car flips all the, the whole nine yards, but he's survived. And he does the classic, right, like, pretend to be dead and then shoot him through your coat situation. <laughs> he does that when he hears the guy, feels the guy close. He gets the guy in the arm. And he comes out. And he overpowers him, and he gets his gun before he can do anything, right? Some spy crap. It's, it's very edge-of-your-seat stuff. And he's semi-torturing the guy with a knife. He's not an expert, so he's just, you know, cutting him. To give me a name. Give me something. Give me something, right? He's just over and over, and he gives him the name of the old man. Before he passes out. Now, I would, would think that he would get the guy, put him in the trunk of the car. Instead, he just leaves him there. I don't know why. But he leaves him there, and he drives, because he, he's sort of making a connection in his head. that Maybe it's something to do with the old man. Drives back to Heron's house. Starts looking around. It's been ransacked, too. Obviously, they're looking for something. And he one clue leads to another clue that, you know, it's he picks up on it because he knows the guy better than the evil Nimrod. He finds some clues, and then he finds like a buried box. And in the box is the beams, right? He, the man had kept a notebook the whole time he'd been working for this organization. And he knows all the names, all the connections. It's, it's the whole nine yards. It could blow the whole thing up, right? And he's like, I got him. I just got to talk to Greenberg. And we're like, you got him. You just got to give it to Greenberg. But then the, the safety he had set up for his girl is taken, right? And because he read the notebook, he knows the Carlisle police are involved. They're dirty as dirty can be. And they're now guarding his lady, Pat. Meaning Pat's basically in the hands of the enemy. The enemy who tortured her last time. And so he's like, I don't care about anything. I don't care about anything but getting my girl back. And so on his way to talk to... Kessler and Seafrom, Seaford. He sees Carlisle cops all around Kessler's house. And so he's like, dang it, Kessler's Kessler's Nimrod. I got a worn seal front and somehow get Greenberg to help get my girl. And he gets run off the road again, only this time he's not so lucky, right? He is sort of dazed. And he gets taken. And you're like, ah, crap, the jig is up. How is he going to get out of this? He's taken by the black Africans, right? And the, the Dubonair guy. And you're like, double crap. You know, he tried that guy tried to kill him. And this guy turns out to be some other kind of an agent, right? Some foreign agent of some sort. He doesn't give us any kind of reality to it. But this man is like our Greenberg. He's very knowledgeable, very skilled. He's got uh, Matlock dead to rights. There's no way out of it. And he's like, your options are to help us get Nimrod, because that's what I want. I'm making my own move. Or I could kill you and your girl, and then contact Nimrod anyway. I'll use your girl as the sacrifice. 
So your options are die or help me. And he's not playing, right? He gets the sense that he has no hope here. So he agrees. And he formulates this sort of very psychological plan, playing on the fact that everyone involved thinks knows Matlock's an amateur. He develops sort of like a reasonable plan that lures Nimrod out, and it works. He lures him to a restaurant, and they're behind this restaurant. And when Nimrod comes out, it he sees he sees Pat first. She's bound. She's not tortured again, but she is bound and bleeding because her stitches came undone. And he's like, you're going to be all right, but he can't untie her because it's reasons, right? He doesn't want to hurt her more. So then he's going to talk, and Nimrod's like, give me the notebook, give me the notebook. Turns out Nimrod is seal front, which shocks him and sort of shocks you. Or maybe you see it coming a little. Every reader's different. But it's, it's shocking, and it's also, again, one of these elements that makes the book stay modern. Because our, our, our president of the, of the university, Carlisle, starts saying all these things that feel relevant to today. He's saying there's a disconnect in America. That, you know, that there's this bubbling up, the, the, all these, this hatred, that, that universities can't get any money, and they had to think of a way to save themselves, because you're like, how do these universities get these endowments, these massive endowments out of the blue? So this realistic sentiment of untrust, of people not caring about anything but their own situation, of government being too busy or too useless to help, paired with this idea that, you know what, maybe the, the universities would try and make some kind of drug ring of their own. You know, tired of seeing all these rich parents just leave. This entrapment kind of thing. It makes a lot of sense, at least for the story it holds. And it's very interesting. But he's shocked. He's shocked it's, it's seal front, and, and it, it, there's no indication, right? I guess if you reread it, maybe you'll see the clues. But it's there, and he's sort of maniacal. But, um, and here's the thing where, like, if it were written today, you would, you would sort of get attacked for being woke. The debonair guy has, like, a black secret force of, of men he's trained up and they're not just strong they're intellectual they're smart right he's done all this super training on them so they're like commandos and people people now would be like oh of course it's some black people but i'm like there's no hint of wokeness if you're worried about it in this story it's very true to itself but this force takes out the carlisle police i, mean, I don't know how many they kill a good chunk i'm assuming at least the chunk that showed up with Nimrod. And then they come out and they, they've they taken Nimrod. Right? And sort of that's how the story ends. He ends it with Pat's been saved. The black guy's going to help everyone because he's true to his deal. There's no reason not to be for him. He's not a horrible... He's, he's like, I'm not a monster. And the story ends, right? Now there's an epilogue, which I chose to read... Books don't normally have an epilogue, right? But I usually read them if they're there. But begrudgingly. I've been stung by a few epilogues just being there to hook you into the next story, if you know what I mean. But this one, I can't tell if this one does, right? Because it ends with we're on the beach, everyone's happy and sunny, and they're discussing him and Pat that he's going to go back to the real life and spill the beans. He's going to blow up everybody, right? We hear that the Debanu got killed. So he doesn't have that to worry about. He's just going to spill the beans. He doesn't care what the FBI says. Right? He's a good guy in the end. But I don't know if this is a standalone or if these three connect. Right? I know they were together. But I have no idea. Right? It could be its own standalone story. And, and as a standalone, it would work. Right? So there it is. There's the they, there's the Matlock paper. At some point he he says in the book he doesn't he stops calling it the Corsican paper because he's in his mind it's my paper. It's the Matlock paper, right? That's why he gets that. It's one of those where you say the title in the movie situations. Not always fun. Always a fun little nougat. 
So, here's the obligatory ad, right, to convince you to buy my books with real money. Hopefully it'll work, I don't know. It can't hurt to try, right? I wonder how long this went. How long are we at? That's a, that's a reasonable time. It's reasonable. I want to thank y'all, you know, for being here. I'm trying. This was one of the first where I was ahead of the curve, right? It's a book I started and finished within a, I guess, a, sort of a half week to week solely for this video. I was going to read it anyway, but I, I read it knowing I would make this video for this YouTube channel. So I don't use my backlog. I'm going to use my backlog to get ahead, you know, and I'll read these thick boys. But thanks for listening, and uh, I'll talk to you next time.